part in the evening when um, the public or anyone may speak to us about something that is not on the agenda. We cannot take action. We cannot have an extended discussion, but we can listen. Um, anyone who wishes to speak has up to three minutes and may speak once. Is there anyone who would like to speak under oral communications? And Sharon, I'm looking to you to let yes. me know. We have one hand raised, Wayne Lee. Oh, Wayne Lee. I don't know, that O is, is a good O. <laughs> I like your haircut too, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Uh, Mayor Dillon no, and uh, town council, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, as you know, there's been quite a, a lot of upheaval in uh, in uh, misogynic, uh, racist violence in the nation, um, and so the uh, Amateo uh, Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, which I'm a member, is taking action to uh, provide some seminars and um, panels for uh, citizens to discuss the, what San Mateo County is doing to try to prevent a lot of this uh, lot of violence. And so on Saturday, uh, or today, the, the police chiefs all gathered in San Mateo to, for a press conference and, and uh, we'll be posting that soon to uh, emphatically state that uh, they're gonna fight racist, racist violence and, um, and it's not, it's, they're not gonna tolerate that in our county and we don't want that spreading into our county. Uh, we want we don't want racism to grow um, and and take and just just you know make our make our world a lot harder. And so this Saturday at 11 o'clock online, uh, anybody who wants to attend, um, we our guests will be uh, District Attorney Steve Wagstaff and Sheriff Bolanos um, and the uh, founder of Stop Asian Hate, uh, Dr. Zhang. And uh, you can sign up at. Uh, smcapi.org, that's Samtio County API.org. Um, so if there's any other questions, uh, so I thank you for your time. And I know that uh, you are also with the Sheriff's Department as Milbury, and I know that you're all supportive and denouncing the violence that's going on. So I'm um, glad to see you all and have a great meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. I was actually just gonna reach out to you. So thank you for this. And we will be sure to post this and get this out. Thanks for doing this really important work and we are absolutely with you. Thank you for your support. Does anyone else wish to speak under oral communications? There are no additional hands raised. Okay. I will move on to oral communication, excuse me. I will move from oral communications to our special presentations tonight. We have two special guests. I will introduce the first guest and Jeremy will introduce the second guest. Our first guest is Supervisor Don Horsley. Um, as I'm sure you know, Don Horsley is our representative on the San Mateo County, County Board of Supervisors for District 3. This is a geographically large and diverse territory which includes all of the coast side from Pacifica to Half Moon Bay to Pescadero, Portola Valley, Woodside, West Menlo Park, San Carlos, part of Belmont, and all the unincorporated areas within those boundaries. <laughs> Supervisor Horsley, who lives in Redwood City in Emerald Hills, began his career in public service as a deputy sheriff in 1972, patrolling East Palo Alto. He worked his way up through the ranks and was elected San Mateo County Sheriff in 1993, a job he held for 14 years. He then served on the Sequoia Healthcare District Board for four years, in 2010, he was elected to the County Board of Supervisors and re-elected in 2014 and 18. The supervisor's been a champion of all things coastal, from enabling the nonprofit Puente to open a medical clinic in Pescadero, to protecting and restoring the watershed, and you'll hear about that from our next guest, to making sure that parts of Highway 1 do not collapse from coastal erosion, to preserving agricultural lands. He is an affordable housing advocate he co-chaired the 2015-16 County Closing the Jobs Housing Gap Task Force, of which I was a member. And he's been a member of the Heart Board for many, many years. I went served on that board with him too. Yeah. He is front and center in transportation. He sits on the San Mateo County Transit Authority Board and the San Mateo County Express Lanes JPA Board. I sit on that board with him. He has a long history of working on behalf of public health 
issues, including mental health, as well as figuring out how to house the homeless, a formidable task during the time of the pandemic. He knows the county water issues, forwards and backwards from stormwater management and green infrastructure to planning for sea level rise. And as such, he is an exceedingly competent board member on the new County Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency District Board. I am on that one too. And in everything he does, he brings an open heart, a curious mind, a roll up your sleeves and let's get it done attitude and an affable disposition. And he often adds a very much appreciated note of levity to technical discussions that otherwise might be considered a tad deadly dull. I can honestly say from working in the trenches with Don over the past decade that he is one of the best examples of a public servant I have ever had the pleasure to meet. Please join me in a warm welcome to our District 3 Supervisor, Don Horsley. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, um, Mayor Derwin. I, I'm um, really touched by your uh, introduction. So good evening, Council members, as well as uh, Town Manager Jeremy Dennis. Uh, Jeremy and I worked together before when he worked for uh, Supervisor Rich Gordon, who's uh, my immediate predecessor. I, I thought what I would do is, uh, because I'm sure there are people uh, tuning into your meeting that month to know something about what the county is doing on COVID. So I, I thought if you wouldn't mind, I was going to give you some uh, quick rundown of where we stand as a county. And we know we are moving. We are now into the orange and we're hopeful of moving into the yellow pretty soon. But just give you some of the numbers that you know, certainly could look this up on the county's webpage as well, but I'll just go through it as quick as I can without taking too much time. But our case right now is 4.4 cases per 100,000. Our positivity rate is 0.9%. Um, and in our lowest healthy places index is 1.8%. So we're really doing very well. We're still doing testing about 770 tests per 100,000. Uh, we do see some of the UK and California uh, variations of, in the virus. Uh, and of course, both of those uh, viruses are much more contagious and spread much more rapidly than the, uh, the original uh, COVID-19. Uh, additionally, about 200,000 residents became eligible on March 15th. But unfortunately, our vaccine um, supply remained basically flat. And so that's one of the reasons that what we've had to do is we've had to stop our uh, first test, our first uh, shot uh, uh, vaccinations. Uh, and what, what the reason for that is the state has directed 40% of the doses to central and southern parts of the state. Uh, so that meant that we've had to really kind of pull back on our first dose vaccine opportunities, but we are still doing mass vaccinations for second dose cases. Um, we do expect to see some increases in the coming weeks, but for now we are pretty much flat. Uh, on March 20th of this year, we have so far 235,224 people have been vaccinated. So that means 36.6% of our total population has been vaccinated. 77.6% of those 65 and older have been vaccinated. 82.3% of those 75 and older have been vaccinated. So what we are doing now is we're doing mobile vaccination clinics for people who are homebound. Uh, the target uh, vaccination sites are really, if you wanted to look at, we are doing some targeted sites in some specific areas that's listed on our website. We've enlisted Safeway pharmacies to uh, help with some of our Medi-Cal patients. And our long-term care facilities of the 389 facilities uh, all have completed a first dose and about 382 have actually completed a second dose. But it turns out there's an additional 113, 32 have been vaccinated and the rest we still have to do, um, you know, check up on them and see what we could do with them. So that kind of gives you a picture, a quick thumbnail sketch. And you can see all those statistics if you take a look at their website, the county's website. I think the county has done really well. That's one of the reasons that we were the first county, actually there's one other county, a very small county was able to go uh, into, um, what are we, an orange or something like that, a little bit before. But we've actually kind of led the way. And I think it's really, uh, really a tribute to our health departments to really a remarkable job. 
The other issue that, you, that your constituents are probably concerned about are fire. And uh, we are working with Cal Fire. We work with the uh, Woodside Fire on the uh, uh, Fire Safe Council. Uh, Kellex Nelson has a staff person that's part of it. And uh, Denise Ania, who used to be the fire marshal for Woodside Fire, is actually the chair. And in this uh, coming budget on our Measure K, I asked for, I didn't get exactly what I wanted. I wanted a lot of millions for fire service, but we were only able to, I was able to, uh, besides other thing that the parks is doing, I was able to get the additional 2 million that is going to be flexibly, well, not allow me to be, to use that money. Well, not me exactly, but you know, because I don't, obviously don't do it, but it gives me some flexibility in moving some of that to our fire safe council because they really need the funding for matching grants because there will be grants out of the state of California and our parks department, if you, again, you look on their website, they have a big uh, list of all their upcoming projects for the next year. We really are focused on for fire, they call them uh, shaded fuel breaks. And apparently what it is, not being a fire expert myself, is that uh, it's not that they don't cut things down, but they take all of the lower line vegetation and, and they essentially, that's fire fuel. That's what they call ladder fuel. If that catches fire and gets into the crown of a tree, then you end up with this major conflict, conflict, conflagration. So they're really focusing on clearing out all that ground stuff. And we're doing fire breaks. Maybe the closest area to you really is probably Wonder Lake. And we're doing some major projects in Wonder Lake. And we also work with, of course, the watershed. Um, <laughs> Homeless is, uh, you know, a significant problem for the county, just as it is for other parts of the state. In fact, it turns out that California has like 12% of the population of the country, but 80% of the unhoused people. And so um, I, I don't know if that's because we have such wonderful weather or what, but uh, San Mateo County, we have set a goal of trying to eliminate homelessness in its entirety. It's one of the ways we're doing it is we're buying hotels. So we bought one on the coast side, we bought two in Redwood City, and we're in negotiations to buy a couple others in uh, San Mateo, looking for another one at the northern part of the county. And we do have a, a facility that's in Redwood City that has currently about, I think about 140 people who are homeless. And we're gonna have to rebuild that facility and move it to another location. And the hope is that we could uh, dramatically increase the capacity and provide some housing for uh, people who are um, essentially really need to be, you know, they're, they're very low income and they may have mental health issues. And uh, essentially they are our clients that probably don't have any other option but to have uh, housing provided by the county at some location. So that gives you a thumbnail little sketch of what the county is doing, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks, Don. Um, Sharon, are there questions? Are people have their hands up? There are no raised hands. What about the council? Do you have questions? Mayor Darwin, we have a raised hand, sorry. Okay, let me finish with the council. Does anybody on the council have a question? All right, back to the public. Christy Corley. Hi, Christy. Hi, Supervisor Hornsley. Uh, thank you so Thanks much for so me. I just wanted to share my experience going to try to get a leftover vaccine yesterday in Redwood City. At Stanford, there was about 50 of us standing outside. I did talk to a female that had gone three days in a row. And then a woman came out and said, no leftover vaccines. So we're just trying to make sure the vaccines don't go in the trash. But I do want you to know that down at that facility, uh, there was 50 of us that were turned away. And uh, I hear that that's happening at many uh, 
hospital vaccine locations in the area. Just wondering what you know about that. Uh, well, I do know that that happens. I, and what happens is that, um, well, let me give you, give you an example. So if we um, uh, say we're setting up a facility for, or a, a, a mobile clinic for say farm workers, and maybe we've got a hundred um, um, doses of vaccine and 90 people show up. Well, now we've got 10 doses left over. And so what we do is we do then offer it to people who um, oftentimes are volunteers on those sites, or they might happen to be, or they know about it and they've um, showed up and, uh, and are lucky enough to be able to, you know, be, take one of those vaccination, vaccines. Once they take that first shot, then they are eligible for the second. And what, what happens is the second shot has to come within, I think within three weeks to uh, four weeks. Right. So uh, I do know that that happens. I know that uh, we don't wanna waste any vaccines. And so um, it, it's inevitable at every facility we have, whether it's at uh, the SF International Airport or it's at the event center, or if it's one of our pop-up clinics, um, we um, invariably, not everyone shows up and there's always a few um, extra doses and the people who are in line uh, get those doses. One of the things that we do do though, is that for example, our court staff, for some reason the governor did not prioritize people in our courts. We think it's important that they be vaccinated. So we do take their names down and uh, when we have extra vaccines, we do call them first. So if we, if we know that, for example, if like, like I said, like I'm saying, if we have a, a clinic and we have a hundred doses and we know that 90 people are not gonna, are, always, are signed up and we're gonna have 10 extra, we will then contact those court staff and have them come down. So we have a, sort of a system, um, but it doesn't, it, you know, it doesn't always work. Okay, well, thank you. I just wanted to report back. Thanks for the report. It's interesting to hear that. Uh, I know that uh, it, well, the system that I went through initially, because I am 77 and I uh, do have asthma and an underlying health condition. I first went through Sutter and I got my first shot through Sutter. Then they then canceled the second shot because they ran out of vaccine. So I then went into the county system and uh, got my second shot through the county system. So the county's done a really great job. In fact, I think we've done better than Kaiser or <clears throat> Or so. <clears throat> I think I see another hand in the public. Wayne Lee, is that a new hand? Yes, it is. Wayne. Yes, it's a new hand. Wayne. Thank you for a second bite. Uh, nice <laughs> to see you, uh, Supervisor Horsley. Um, I think uh, your beard looks pretty distinguished. <laughs> Someone has said that. Uh, somebody remarked that you probably actually look Asian too, so it makes you more distinguished. <laughs> uh, well, my uh, my granddaughter's Asian. <laughs> My, my daughter-in-law is from Taiwan. So my, uh, you know, I did my, they live in Berkeley. So I, when all the anti-Asian um, stuff call came, it started, we started seeing those reports. I called my granddaughter, Meng Sheng, and uh, asked her if she had seen that in high school. And she has not, fortunately. I said, if you tell, if any, anybody bothers you, tell your grandpa. <laughs> well, you know, the young people are our future and I have a lot of hope for them. Yeah. Um, my question has to do with mental health. Uh, I think it's great that the county is, is doing a lot and doing a lot of uh, making a lot of impact on the homeless. Uh, what we're experiencing is also um, people who don't want to go into like the housing and have mental health issues. Uh, and on top of that, our policemen are also asked to evaluate mental health issues and people and sometimes it doesn't end up very well. So I was wondering, what is the county doing about us? Um, <laughs> well, I mean, three things. One is that when I was talking about uh, our clients, what I was saying, uh, what I meant to say is that uh, for certain clients who have mental health issues, we would like to have them in permanent supportive housing, meaning that they have to be, you know, very, very low income because some people only subside, subsist on eight or nine hundred dollars a month, and so we have really very low income. At the same time, we have to have case management because if for people who have significant mental health issues, they need they do need to have a lot of support. So we do look for places to have permanent supportive housing. 
The other thing we're doing is that we have a current, many people don't know this, but we have a mental health hospital in, uh, where is it? Uh, um, I guess it's Corlaris Canyon, essentially. And in fact, it's called, it's, it's, uh, it is Cordilleras, and it's a, it's a hospital facility for about 116 people. It was built in the 1950s originally as a tuberculosis uh, hospital. And um, I started some years back really pushing to replace it, a more modern facility that instead of a big concrete structure, I wanted to have something that was a more normalized uh, facility. So we are embarking. It's actually a pretty ex expensive <laughs> project, but it's in the same location in that core, uh, that, that, that same canyon area. So it's really kind of an open space area. It's essentially in exactly the same place that it's currently at. So we don't have to worry about, you know, neighbors not wanting it. Um, and it's, and it's uh, close enough to Redwood City and close enough to San Carlos that there's bus service available easy for families to get and visit to, to be able to visit a loved one. So that's one thing that we're gonna do a groundbreaking in April the, I think it's April the 4th. Um, so uh, I should, I'll probably, what I will do for the council, I'll send you uh, the invitation to watch the groundbreaking. I'm really excited about it. It'll be a facility for 120 folks. There's also a facility for mentally, or youth with mental illness, it's, uh, Canyon Oaks. It has a certainly a, a, a significantly smaller number of young people. Um, and then the other thing we are doing is we're working with police departments in um, Redwood City, San Mateo, South San Francisco, and Daly City, and we are embedding clinicians in with law enforcement. And the purpose would be all those high-risk cases that officers call are called upon where a person is armed or assaultive. Um, we want a clinician to go with the officers to do a better case, a better um, evaluation to um, essentially de-escalate those cases so we have a better, safer outcome. And at the same time, just to make sure that we are on the right track, we've engaged uh, the Gardner Center to do an evaluation of that project. And our hope is that what we will do is change policies with law enforcement, improve the response uh, for uh, to uh, people who are in mental health crisis and uh, come up with a safer and better uh, alternative. And at the same time, we also have some other facilities too. We have a, oh, I can't think of all the names of all these programs. We have a Serenity House that is uh, on the campus of our hospital. And that's a place where instead of taking somebody who has a mental health crisis into either a psych ward or jail, they can take them to Serenity House uh, for short-term treatment. And it's not a locked facility, but there are you know, staff available, treatment staff. And it's a, it's a step, well, it's, it's taking somebody out of their crisis environment, uh, giving them treatment, but at the same time, not putting them into a hospital or certainly not a jail. So there's a number of things, a number of, uh, projects and that we are uh, embarking on or have embarked on in the in the past and I, I think the county has a pretty robust system of support for people with uh, mental health issues thanks john richards i see your hand up okay i just don i just had a question about another another angle that some uh, towns seem to be taking for the partly cover the issue of housing but other poverty related um, problems. And that is the message, the news that Oakland has joined, I guess, Stockton and putting out a, a guaranteed income for the next 18 months, I think it is. Uh, they're planning on giving to uh, hundred, uh, several, I don't remember how many people, um, but a $600 stipend per month for 18 months. Uh, and for people under a certain level of the poverty level or add around that level. So I'm just wondering, is there anything comparable being talked about in our county? Do you know of? Well, not, not exactly the same thing, but I, I could say that uh, maybe it should have had a, a little print on it. One of some of the things that we've done, we have, um, I think over the, in this past year, we, between county funds and CARES funds and private donations, put out about $151 million um, 
helping small businesses, helping renters, helping property owners. So I think the county's done a remarkable job. In one of our ventures, we put out about $11 million to provide stipends to people who are were not helped by either the state or federal government's actions. Um, so I, I'm pretty proud of what the county has done. One of the difficulties of doing like a, a, a stipend of um, to individuals, you really can't, as far as I know, you can't really use, you know, money. It, it's, it's, it's called, that would be called a gift of public funds. You have to raise money privately. Um, and, you know, we are a big county and uh, we have a lot of need. For example, I was, uh, before the call, I was saying that, telling Jeremy Dennis that I, I'd met with a group of farm workers and I do this provide, you know, periodically to find out what they need and how the county can be of help. And at the same time, we have farm workers and people who are very low income in, in, in North Fair Oaks. So um, we, we do a lot through our core agencies. We provide, uh, right now we have a, a fund of about $47 million to end rent debt for people making less than 80,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would put up our numbers and our help that we've given to low income folks against any city and any county. I think we've done exceptional. Sounds great. Thanks, John. Yeah, I think, I think the county has done exceptionally well, taking care of the people on the margins. Uh, Jeremy, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Through the chair, uh, Supervisor Horsley, uh, it's been six months since the CZU Lightning Complex fire that certainly affected much of your district. And I was wondering if there were any any thoughts or um, ideas that you wanted to share that came out of that, maybe uh, you know lessons learned or um, any other experiences that you wanted to share with us tonight. Uh, yeah, there were a couple. In fact, uh, you and Kevin from uh, Woodside, we talked about things like uh, we were one, at one time thinking about sirens. We thought, no, they'll drive everybody nuts because you have to practice them once a month and everybody would be wondering about what are these sirens going off? We didn't think that would work. We did look at cameras and I know it's a Cal Fire. We are looking for uh, sites to put cameras, basically like a fire watch. And I think that has the potential of being you know, relatively successful in the sense that if you can spot a fire before it gets very big, I think we have a pretty good shot at uh, knocking it down. The other thing we did is that um, fire department came across um, an app developer and they called it Zone Haven. And originally they said uh, this Zone Haven would help with evacuations. And so we put between myself and Supervisor Canopy, we put about eh, three or 400,000 into the development of this. And it turns out that this is a really fabulous system that is a system of being able to uh, help the, both the police and firefighters know, you know, just incredible amount of information about particular zones and it helps them with evacuation. So we used this in a CZU fire and used it to evacuate 80,000 people without a single injury. So, um, so, you know, <clears throat> so that development of that system, and I think it's gonna end up going statewide. That system is so good in terms that it shows all the roads in and out where if you're gonna, where you would have to block it to block people from coming in and how you would have to, or you, how you would bring people out. Also gives you information about people who are um, not mobile. It might give you information about if you have, for example, a board and care facility, if you have a restaurant, if you have a gas station, it just has all the demographic information of by region, by specific zones, it's an incredible system. So you ought to have your fire agency explain how, um, how it works. It really is a, it's a great tool. It's not the only thing I think we'll have to keep on looking for, you know, newer and better ways of protecting ourselves. I think we're gonna to have to look at, somehow we're gonna to have to help homeowners with um, um, basically creating safe zones around their houses. And you know, it's difficult you know, for example, like in my own house, we have two maples that are really close to the house. We cut one down because it was too close to the house. It's painful to do because it was a lovely tree and it gave wonderful shade. People are going to have to do that if you want to make yourself and your home safe. 
Thank yep, you so had, much. I had to cut down a huge pepper tree right by the house that yes, shaded yeah. an entire room. Um, okay, I think we have, do we have, oh, Jeff Alfs. Thank you. Know. Yeah, I wanted to concur with you, Supervisor, on Zone Haven. We've actually gotten a few demonstrations of it locally, and it is, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be a really important tool for us moving forward. So thanks for, for your role in helping that move forward. I also was just going to, you mentioned the Cordilleras facility that's being re, uh, refurbished, I believe. And I just wanted to point out and thank you for, um, I, I actually came across that project because it was an entrance in the, our PCE's all electric building challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. Along with uh, the office building that's going in next to the uh, at the at, at, at county center, I just wanted to thank you and the board for for taking the lead on all electric building, um, and you know we're 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 working on some efforts to basically sort of decarbonize the county, uh, you know, just take these things countywide, and you've been supportive, and I look forward to working with you more on that. Well, I, I will say one thing that county government never we never well in government we never like to admit mistakes, but our first. <laughs> our first building, it was going to be a, a, a net energy zero. And, and, and the, um, the design that the architect came up with was really complicated. And um, a project that was supposed to be 100 million turned out to be 200 million. So we had to say, tell the architect, uh, goodbye. <laughs> we had to start all over again and um, yeah. come up with a different plan because the building was a marvelous architectural marvel. It was going to be a beautiful facility, but it was just too expensive to build. And it looked like it was going to be way too expensive to maintain. And so we discarded it. We're going to come up with a, a different facility for a newer county office building. And the really exciting thing about it, it's going to be essentially, um, it's a, a newer wood uh, facility instead of steel. So we're going to use a less concrete and steel which would, of course, use less yep. energy. Um, yeah. I think that you call it compressed laminated wood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same strength as, uh, as steel. But one of the reasons we wanted to do that is because San Mateo County, even though we are the center of Silicon Valley, we have 70% of open space, marvelous redwood forest. And so we wanted to kind of highlight both the fact that we are Silicon Valley, and that's why we do the net energy zero, and but to also highlight the fact that this is a, a beautiful uh, county of uh, open space. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. I think that we have exhausted the questions and I think it's probably a good time to stop. So I really want to yeah. thank you, Dawn, for visiting us tonight. If our residents would like to contact you, what's can you put, can somebody put the uh, email address in the chat? Um, yeah, I could do, I guess, yeah, I could do that. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. All righty. Just got to find the chat. There we go. <laughs> and Mayor Derwin will make sure tomorrow in, in the weekly message to uh, share that information as well. So thanks again for visiting us and I will see you probably next week. And any residents who want to see Don, he's always around. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to join the council this evening. All righty. Bye-bye. Bye. Our second presentation is about the San Mateo County Resource Conservation District. And Jeremy is going to introduce our special guest. Thank you, Mayor Darren, members of the council. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Kellex Nelson, the executive director of the San Mateo County Resource Conservation District. I'll let her explain what that is. That's why she's here tonight. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about Kellex. Kellex has been with the RCD for 15 years. Um, so she is a wealth of knowledge on conservation uh, and networking related issues and bringing people together to talk about um, these important topics. Um, Kellex, previous to that, um, had worked in a couple different um, environmental related fields, but there's always a tidbit about Kellex's past that I love to share is that she drove a truck for a year, cross country, an 18 wheeler um, about 20 years ago. Um, so I think that tells you a little bit about about Kellex. Uh, I've known Kellex for a very long time. I consider her a friend. Um, she is one of the most optimistic human beings you'll ever meet. Um, always brings um, a spirit of can do to every project that, that she works on. And working with the supervisor, with Supervisor Horsley, who, was, uh, who um, succeeded my former boss, Supervisor Gordon, really cracked some important nuts out on the coast in uh, the last uh, number of years related to flooding issues and, and other issues. 
So with that, Kelly, I'd like to turn it over to you. Welcome tonight. Thank you. That was a fun introduction, Jeremy. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having a chance to, to get to, to know you all. My, my guess is that the Resource Conservation District in our county or the RCD is probably the best form of local government that you've never heard about. Um, and so I just want to kind of get a sense as I'm talking, can you tell me um, how many of you have actually heard of the Resource Conservation District or RCD before? Okay. Okay, a couple. And now put your hand up if you actually know what that is. One. Okay. Okay, a little bit. Okay. Thank you. So um, I love talking about the RCD, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and if you ever want me to um, make a more formal presentation or PowerPoint, I'd be happy to. But I thought I would just do a quick introduction um, to our district. So we're a local special district that includes in our boundaries uh, portions of your town. And, um, and we also work outside our boundaries. We're enabled to do that under statute. So we um, have addressed concerns that are beyond our current boundaries. Um, we, we've been around for over 80 years. We were formed as a response to the Dust Bowl crisis um, when the, the government, the national government realized that soil is actually a precious resource and part of our national security and our food security, et cetera. Fast forward 80 years, our work is has really evolved. And so um, we exist in partnership with the Federal Natural Resources Conservation Service. And we're this form of government that exists county by county. There's about 100 of them in the state of California, about 3,000 nationally. They're in almost every county, and a lot of people have never heard of us. Um, but what we do is we help people help the land. We work where we're invited, we work in partnership, and we're this really interesting, nimble, hyper-local form of government that addresses local priorities. And those priorities regarding natural resources have evolved over time, right? So the, the priorities that we're focused on currently is we, our, our program areas are wildlife, which is basically um, working to restore habitat for threatened and endangered species. Water resources. So we help um, conserve water, develop water resources and protect water quality and address water pollution. Agriculture, we were formed by farmers and we help agriculture be locally viable and be part, be, be, we help farmers and ranchers be environmental stewards. Um, forest health and wildfire is our newest um, area of focus, and that is um, was obviously addressing a real need of our community, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. And then the, the final program area is climate, and so we work to help natural and human communities be more resilient to climate change that is here and is coming. But we also help to mitigate climate change, not just by reducing emissions, but literally by drawing greenhouse gases down from the atmosphere and storing them in soils and vegetation from which they came to be part of the solution to climate change. So those are our basic program areas. And I think that, um, um, that I think what is also kind of interesting about the RCD is that we work property by property where we're invited, but we also work at scale. We work at watershed scale, at um, food shed scale. We work at the scale of where fires go. Uh, we work at the scale of where critters migrate, you know, removing dams from creeks and restoring tens of miles of passage for endangered fish. But also I think what is really cool about our work and one of the things I love about it is that we work at the intersection of um, people in the natural world where we recognize that working lands are businesses. We recognize that people live here. We recognize that it is not enough to fence off tracts of land and consider conservation done. Those lands need to be managed and that people use water and that people are here to stay for a while. So, 
Um, so our job is to work in this intersectional space and find these solutions that work for that are sustainable for people in the in the landscape, where um, where farms, fish, and people can thrive. And there's no shortage of projects that are large and small in which we do that. Um, some of you may be familiar with the flooding that happened um, regularly in the community of Pescadero and pretty much the only road into town. And so we worked after decades of hearing that that was impossible. There's nothing you could do about it. It was either that you took care of the natural preserve or you cared about the people in the community and you had to choose one. And we found a path through that actually removed the, a barrier, the, the sediment under the road that had completely filled a creek and was causing chronic flooding of the town was also a barrier to ancestral migration of endangered coho salmon to an entire watershed. And furthermore, removing that dredge material, we could use it to patch in certain parts of Pescadero Marsh that were causing annual massive die-offs of threatened steelhead trout. So we were able in one project with a number of partners to address flooding, community safety, resilience to climate change, resilience to sea level rise, migration corridors, water quality, all while honoring the, the farm that was nearby and what its business needs were and community input, et cetera. That's, that's, um, that's how we roll, is with a lot of input from people who have very diverse interests. We're literally formed to work across the aisle. Uh, what is nowadays considered novel is what we were formed to do. We also do things like carbon farming, where we work with farms and ranches to reconfigure and reimagine their um, the way that they work that protects or maybe improves their yield um, and understands their business operation while all through um, the lens of how much carbon can be drawn down from the atmosphere and stored in um, the vegetation and the healthy soils. Our last, uh, to date, we've completed 11 of these site-specific carbon farm plans in San Mateo County that when implemented, will draw down 1,400 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent annually, which is the equivalent of over 1,800 acres of forests per year, or 302 cars on the road per year. So I had to look at another screen to remember those numbers. Um, and then we were involved with things like water quality monitoring um, and um, reducing pollutants coming off the landscape and helping people be stewards of those lands for beneficial outcomes. And then one of the things that I think is most germane to your town is the work that we're doing to manage forest health and reduce the risk of catastrophic fire. So in partnership with the Fire Safe Council, which under contract from the county, we also coordinate the San Mateo County Fire Safe Council. Um, and many RCDs actually around the state coordinate their Fire Safe Councils in service to the folks who lead those councils. Um, so through the Fire Safe Council, we run the chipping program that comes to neighborhoods and helps residents reduce their fuel loads by hauling off the, um, the, the branches and vegetation that they've removed. But we also, in partnership with the Resource Conservation District in Santa Cruz County, received uh, $5.3 million from CAL FIRE to, um, to conduct fuel load reduction projects on um, about 1,000 acres of land. Um, two that are closest to you are Hutter and Wonderlick County Parks, about 400 acres of fuel load reduction and forest health improvements. Our work with um, with fire is both to reduce the risk of catastrophic fire, um, to help people have egress um, when there is a fire, and that's in support of the firefighting agencies. And also, unfortunately, after the catastrophic fires last summer, we were called upon to help people recover from that fire, from catastrophic fire. We were the soil conservation district when we were formed, so things like mudslides, debris flows, creeks, erosion is very much in our wheelhouse. Um, and also one of the things that I think very few people know is that um, the reason that one of the main reasons that the fire didn't advance north was the work that we were doing on Old Hall Road in San Mateo County Parks 
when the fire started to get there, we had crews that were repairing that road that were certified by Cal Fire. And we partnered with County Parks and Cal Fire instantly to repurpose those crews and stop the fire from advancing north past Old Hall Road. I think that's another well-kept secret that most people don't know that that is why the fire didn't jump across and, and march north. By the way, we're not a firefighting entity. We happen to be there with crews and that's not what we plan to do in the future. But I think it speaks more to the fact that we're a very nimble form of local government that can respond to the need when it exists. So that's a little bit of an overview of, um, of who we are. And, um, and to Jeremy's point, I've known Jeremy for a long time. He's one of the people who actually introduced me to this work back when he was a legislative aide for then supervisor Rich Gordon and, um, and helped introduce me to this work in San Mateo County. Um, actually, I think back then I was working for Peninsula Open Space Trust, maybe. Um, so that was a while ago. So anyway, I love what the RCD does and I wanted to introduce it to you. I thank you, um, Jeremy and Mayor Derwin for inviting me to be here. And I'd be happy to come back at some future point, show you videos of the work or photos of the work or do a PowerPoint or focus on any of our program areas. Um, but at, at this level of introduction, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I would love you to come back, but it's not just my decision. Jeremy, do you have a hand up? I do. Uh, you know, one of the, the there were a couple of things that I just wanted to highlight. Um, you know, first that the um, the RCD now has the ability to work in our community because of its sphere and influence changes. So this is new um, to us. Um, and when I uh, heard from Kellex about this, I was certainly excited. You, you can see the breadth of the programming that certainly applies to town, but in particular, it, the work that they're doing around uh, fire that uh, I was very in, intrigued by. The um, RCD supports fire safe San Mateo County um, and what they do. So they're uh, obviously um, uh, an incredible resource for what we are doing and what we're gonna do in the future. I've already had a couple conversations with Kellex and her staff about what the town has done and what the town is planning to do. And certainly in the future, we hope to engage the RCD on all manner of wildfire preparedness, resiliency, mitigation and the like. Um, but I, I wanted to point that out in, in particular, but um, uh, yeah, Kellex, you, you are, will obviously be invited back for uh, future presentations. And I hope the council has some questions for Kellex. Thanks, Jeremy. Council, do you have questions? Well, in lieu of a question, if I, if I may add um, that one of the things that we always wanna know is what your priorities are. Um, and so if we know what your priorities are, there are priorities. Mm -hmm. And um, one of our staff um, who manages our forest health and, and uh, fire resiliency program, she assists CAL FIRE in the coastal regional prioritization uh, effort. So the, the, the state of California broke, um, broke the state up into regions to develop pri like uh, regional prioritization for projects that would be developed and be competitive for funding that comes from the state. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's important for us to know what projects might be priorities for you so that we can help queue them up um, to be implemented and to be successful and provide technical assistance. Similarly, um, one of the things, there were a number of people from, uh, from town who participated historically in our, our livestock and land program that provided technical assistance to equestrians to help them manage um, their, manage their property in ways that were beneficial to horse health while also um, beneficial to the watershed health and to water quality. And that was a big area of engagement with a lot of people from, from your town in the past. Um, and then also we removed the lowermost barrier to fish passage on San Francisco Creek, the Bondi Weir, that helped fish migrate up into the watershed um, historically. So we've been involved also in habitat restoration and fish migration. So all of these were things that we did that were responses from people asking us and telling us that this was their priority. So by all means, let us know what you want. Absolutely, we will. I see one, are there, I will leave the, my colleagues for a second while they think. And I will move to our public. 
Christy Corley. Hi, thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you do. It's wonderful work. I did want to, you asked a question, what could we use more of? And I'm looking at the wildfire cameras up on the ridge and I'm not seeing a ton of them. I guess if we were to get funds, I would uh, just ask for more wildfire cameras to help protect Portola Valley. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Christy. Um, I'm bringing it back to my colleagues and I Here think- you, you, you have a couple more questions have, from yeah. her hands. Oh, okay, now I see some hands. Lucy Neely. Hi there, council, staff, and Kellex. Kellex, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm super stoked on the work you do. I'd love to talk to you for hours and I'll definitely be in touch. Um, one question that I had right now, I'm stoked on the carbon sequestration work you're doing and also the firework. And I'm just wondering, do you weave those together? Like in the approach to firework in San Mateo County, do you approach that with, a, with the goal of carbon sequestration also? And if so, how does that happen? Yes. Um, in fact, we have for those just for for um, for Hutter and Wonder Lake projects. I can I don't I don't have the number handy, but we actually have um, quantified how much that will sequester carbon. So I'd say if if um, if there were a Venn diagram of um, of forest health and fuel load reduction in forests, there's a pretty significant overlap between what makes forests healthy and what makes them more fire resilient. And typically healthy forests are ones that sequester more carbon, let alone the fact that catastrophic wildfire is a huge emission of carbon, right? So there's like what you're potentially preventing, but also um, what happens when you have healthy soils and, um, and the right growth of like larger trees rather than a bunch of smaller spindly trees and, and little brushy invasive exotic species and that sort of thing. So um, carbon sequestration is a big part of um, of forest health. And then what was your other question? Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Judith Murphy. Thank you. Um, hi, Kellex. I'd like to ask, um, it's a major issue right now in our town and all up and down the peninsula uh, this increased concern for fire safety has led to some remarkably overzealous clearing um, that's that's paid uh, not nearly enough attention to habitat erosion, seasonal concerns, etc. And I'm wondering uh, if your district has, uh, in the past, with your work, created any guidelines about how to balance the the fire safety and the habitat and the regrowth, etc. Yeah, there's, I mean, this is a pretty significant statewide and nationwide conversation, right? Um, so um, I think I think what is particular about the RCD is that we are a conservation district. We're rooted in conservation. I think the fact that often people who are really concerned about fire safety don't trust the fact that we're about conservation and people who are about <laughs> conservation don't trust the fact that we're about fire safety is probably a good thing um, because it means that we are finding the, the balance. Um, so there's a few different answers to that question. Um, one is that, of course, um, we have to go through the, the secret process in all of the permitting that, that, is, um, that considers um, environmental impacts to this work. But the other is that we are actively seeking to build forest health through fuel load reduction projects. I think there are times that you do um, have to break a few eggs to make an omelet. Like, I'll be honest about that. And we see that in restoration too, you know, where you remove vegetation to, um, as part of a project to restore hydrology for wetlands, for example. So there can be um, temporary impacts. And I think those can be really disturbing and scary and look really disruptive. And so um, it's important to look at the long-term, um, are you restoring habitat and ecosystem function and process 
and the long term, even if there are temporal impacts and how significant are those impacts. But the short answer to your question is, yeah, we do think about it. Um, I don't know of any absolute um, replicable, you know, standards that apply to every project, but I know that it's something that we have to consider, we have to document, we have to uh, be able to explain and defend for our permits, and it's something that we consider in project design and development. But I want to acknowledge that there have been some projects, I've seen them, that, um, that have left areas as a wasteland that um, can, can accelerate erosion, can, um, can be invitations for invasive species to take over and not have habitat benefits, and that when those invasive species really take over, then they can increase the fire risk for communities. These, these projects have to be thought through well. But by the same token, we need to get them done. And we, I think that we have to make sure that, um, that while we're considering the risk of taking action, we're also considering the risk of inaction and making sure that we're moving forward in thoughtful ways. And that's hard and requires a lot of community conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mayor Derwin, through the, through the chair, uh, Kellex, if you are, um, put you on the spot a little bit, but the Conservation Committee, that Judy Murphy is the chair of the Conservation Committee. And I, I would love if you or your staff came to a future Conservation Committee meeting um, and talk about these and other issues so I can coordinate yeah. with three of you. Okay, great. Yeah, I would love to. Um, um, Judy, you might also be interested, some of you might be interested in, I, I spent much of the last year actually on detail for about 90% of my time with Natural Resources Secretary Wade Crowfoot. He's the Secretary for California of Natural Resources. Um, because I also participate in an, a group called the California Landscape Stewardship Network that covers about 40% of California and uh, California's geography. And we're looking at um, in visioning um, what stewardship of our lands looks like in the future and understanding that we've got wicked thorny problems that are happening at a scale and a pace that we have not seen before and that our current systems and ways of thinking do not work and that when it comes to climate change winning slowly is losing and so um, what are the systems changes what are the big thinking systems changes that we need to address the pace and scale of the threats that we're facing and it requires a different way of thinking so i spent much of the last year um, on an initiative called cutting green tape where we explored how the unintended consequences of environmental regulations that were intended to, to stop, and they're very effective at stopping bad actions, but unfortunately they have a broad net that also catches beneficial actions. And so how do we ensure that environmental regulations don't stop environmental restoration from happening um, effectively and efficiently? And so we went through a, a year long process with about 150 stakeholders from around the state and developed a set of 14 recommendations for how the state can have sort of right fitting regulations that enable environmental restoration to happen while minimizing the unintended consequences of what happens when you're doing that work. So Judy, if you're or anybody else is interested in that, um, I can, I can um, maybe send Jeremy the link to that report into that process. Yeah, I think we would really like to see that link. Okay. Are there any other questions from attendees or panelists? Seeing none. Kellex, this has just been absolutely fascinating and you are totally fitting into our ethos here in Portola Valley and we want to have you back. I'd love to, thank you for having me. Thank you. And I have, one message. I have one message for you from a friend. Um, Alex Von Felt says, Brutus says hi. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. All righty. Okay, that is the end of our presentations for tonight. And now we have to move on to the more boring things including the consent agenda. The consent agenda is uh, generally voted on by our 
council um, unless somebody wishes to pull something, but any member of the public may comment on the consent agenda before we vote and any member of the public may speak for up to three minutes per item. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak to something on our consent agenda tonight? Okay. Council, would anyone like to pull something from the consent agenda? Christy's hand just went up, Marianne. Oh, okay. Sorry, Christy. You've got to be a little quicker. Christy. Hello. I just wanted to uh, see if we can talk about traffic in Portola Valley on one of the items on the consent agenda. Okay. I Which one? I think it'd be the Neely, but I, I want to hear your as elected officials comments on it. Okay. Does anybody else wish to comment on the consent agenda? Council, would anyone like to pull something from the consent agenda? Oh, uh, minutes, please. Okay, minutes. Item number three, anything else you'd like to pull? Okay, is there a motion to approve item four, five, six, and seven? So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. Okay. Roll call, Sharon. Council member Alves. Aye. Council member Wernicott. Aye. Council member Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes. Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Consent agenda item number three, minutes. Jeff? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, hold on. Um, red page uh, seven in the uh, fourth paragraph, uh, Senator Becker uh, talks about Tony Atkins, who's been terrific. Uh, I think it, believe, it should read, uh, and who appointed him to six committees. It says pointed him to, but it should be appointed, A-P-P-O-I-N-T-E-D. Okay. Uh, and then uh, red page, oh, red page uh, 11, a little typo, uh, Brandy DeGarmo's name is misspelled. Okay. And red page 12, they misspelled my name twice. Um, <laughs> um, once is a typo, twice is, yeah, um, nitpicking, but that's just thought I'd correct those. Okay, thank you for those. And, and with that, I would move, oh, if no one, well, if no one has any comments, but uh, go since, ahead, John. That's what we're talking about is I, I did notice one um, little typo on page, red page 19. In the second line, uh, it said we have also we've also been engaged in wildfire related issues and support firewire. I think they oh. probably didn't mean the firewire. Firewise. Oh yes. Fire safe. I would be happy, but I don't. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, then. May I have a motion to approve the minutes with those changes? So move. Okay. Second. Second was John. Yep. All righty. Roll call, please, Sharon. Councilmember Alves. Aye. Councilmember Warnikoff. Aye. Councilmember Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes. Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Moving on to the regular agenda, item number eight is a recommendation by the Planning and Building Director, the Annual Housing Element Progress Report for last year. And who is going to take this one? I will, thank you. Um, good evening, Thanks, Mayor and Council members. Um, I know that many of you are familiar with the process, but I wanted to give just a little bit of background in case there's any um, that are getting up to speed on the housing element. And so the housing element is a required part of the general plan. 
And part of the housing element is the regional housing needs allocation. And that's what we call RENA. So when you hear people talking about RENA, that's what it's short for. And that's the number of units that the town is required to plan for in each housing element cycle. So we have eight year cycles under state law and we're in the middle of one right now. And you might've heard that we're starting to plan for the next one that's coming up. So this report is um, related to the housing element cycle that we're in right now. If you're interested in the housing element cycle that's coming up, there's a link in the staff report that'll take you to the town council's last discussion on this item. And there's also an FAQ on housing elements that's attached to the staff report if you are um, kind of getting the base information on this process. So what we do is we track progress towards meeting our arena goals. And we do that by counting the number of net new housing units that we have each year. And we do that through building permit issuance. So we track projects early in the process and we also track them for when they're finaled. But the um, measure that counts for the arena um, is the building permit issuance. So each year we're required to submit this annual progress report to HCP on forms that they provide. So if you saw those very large spreadsheets um, that are difficult to read, my apologies, but that's what HCD makes us do. Um, so we've given you the excerpt of those reports um, for you to see. And so we report using those forms and then we're required to bring it to the legislative body. That's you, the town council. Our town's practice is to also bring it to the planning commission. So we brought the report to the planning commission um, last week and they um, are on the 17th and they reviewed the report. They asked some clarifying questions. They didn't provide any specific um, feedback. There was a question about the way that we count some of the lower income units that staff is gonna follow up on. But we do feel confident that the way that we're reporting it is consistent with the HCD guidelines at this time. And so in terms of the details of the report itself, um, many of you are aware that our RENA allocation for this cycle is 64 net new units. And that's for the time period of 2015 to 2023. And so we're reporting on calendar year 2020, which was obviously an unusual year in many ways. Um, we still had good housing production, even under those circumstances, but a little bit different form than than what we often see. So we had four building permits that were issued for net new housing units. And those were for three accessory dwelling units or ADUs and six units of affiliated housing at the priory. And so those were units that were approved in concept through a master plan through a CUP through the affiliated housing program. And then the ASCC reviewed the specific design of it in the previous year. And then the building permit was issued in 2020. And so that includes one deed restricted unit under their conditional use permit conditions of approval. And so that's a low income unit. And then the other five units fell within the, um, we assume it's gonna be moderate income because they're for the staff um, and the faculty at the Priory. So we worked with them on that in the past. So that brings our total number of net new units for this cycle up to 88. Um, so we have exceeded the total number of units that were assigned to the town through the RENA process. Um, but the units are allocated across different income categories. And so we've exceeded the very low and the above moderate um, income categories. And we still have units that are remaining in the low and the moderate income. But I do think that this progress is significant um, even in a pandemic year to have these number of um, building permits issued for these units. So another part of the annual report is related to the programs that are in the housing element. And some years there's a lot of activity and action in these programs and other years, not as much. And that is typical to see in an eight year housing element cycle. We didn't see as much activity in these categories, again, largely due to the pandemic, but some of the council's priorities are expressed here in terms of ongoing priorities and issues. Um, the programs are outlined in the staff report um, the updates are, are similar to what the council saw last year um, based on the, the um, events of 2020, but they include inclusionary housing, um, affiliated housing, ADUs, which continue to be an important priority, and then some of the smaller programs related to shared housing, 
fair housing, mm -hmm. energy conservation and sustainability, continuing to explore future housing needs and transitional and supportive housing ordinance amendment. So as I mentioned, there are some attachments um, for people to review um, and, and some additional information. And that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Laura. Colleagues, does anyone have a question? Craig, and then Jeff. Yes, two questions. Um, the first one uh, is one I've asked before, but if you could just remind us, Laura, um, we, the, the, the category that we're furthest behind on and not quite on track potentially to hit by the end of the cycle is in the low category, but we're above where we need to be for very low. And so um, I, I think we've had discussion in the past with HCD about whether we can bubble up essentially, that if we have units that are too low, whether they count towards those you know, low um, and I think that, you know, the intention of HCD is generally to create units that are accessible. So we're making them more accessible than that presumably ought to be better, maybe. But on the other hand, they may want to balance. So um, could you tell us about that and whether HCD is, is going to be okay with kind of where we're at if, we're, if we miss on one of the categories? Is that a big deal? Um, our understanding continues to be that the different income le levels matter, that we are trying, trying to hit our goals in each of the different income categories. Mm -hmm. And there are some, um, there's laws that really speak to that in terms of um, trying to meet the targets in the different areas. And so I think that there is, you know, understanding that providing lower income units is probably beneficial. Um, than a lot more higher income units. But I don't think that there's a technical mechanism to be able to get credit for it. Um, okay. In terms of, you know, uh, penalty, um, you know, we do have information and, and CARA can always provide more information about what happens if we don't meet those goals. <clears throat> but I think that having 88 total units, you know, with arena of 64, I think is meaningful when HCD and others are looking at our numbers. And then my other question is what, what would make the unit, I mean, given that we're, we're missing in that one category, um, is there anything that, uh, actually, I guess it's a two part question. One, are the Stanford units would be in the very low category or would some of those fall into the low category potentially based on, I know their application isn't final, but based on what you've seen so far, where does it look like those BMR units would land? And then the other question is, is there anything we can do to, if we, if it makes sense to, to encourage people to, I don't know, put in a full marble bathroom in their ADU to push something from very low into low. So we, we fill all the categories. Uh, what, what, what kinds of things make a difference there, I guess. So in regards to the Stanford application, the current proposal has six of the 12 units are the low category and the other six have not been designated yet. And that will need to be determined through the review and entitlement process. Okay. So you. that's what we know about Stanford so far. Mm -hmm. In terms of how the units are allocated, we are using the formula mm -hmm. the town adopted with the housing element itself. And that was a modification based on a study that was done countywide by 21 elements. And so we have continued to use that methodology because we think it is the most sound um, to continue to use what we have in our approved housing element. But we, you know, we recognize that some dynamics have changed. And so we may now be using assumptions um, that are not as fresh. And so that is, um, <laughs> but it's common situation uh, for cities and towns to be in. And so I think in future years, certainly in the next housing element, we'll be looking at a more rigorous method to allocate those units to the different income categories. And I think it will be more meaningful in the next housing element cycle than it is in this one. Okay, thank you. Jeff. Thank you. Uh, there was one unit that was deed restricted. Um, was there something unique to the circumstances of that unit or does it suggest that we could actually get more deed restricted units in the future? My first question. Um, that deed restricted unit was required by the priory CUP. 
Um, so that is in their conditional use permit. So my assumption, though I don't know for sure, is that the town requested at least one deed restricted um, BMR unit. And so that's why they provide it. Okay. Um, and then the other one, with the uh, above, above moderate includes market rate housing? It does. So we've, in 2020, we only had one, one um, permit issued for just a, a market rate house? Well, that's only net new units. So it's, we okay, didn't have so like any one. new houses built where there wasn't one before. We had okay. demolition. So one lot, one lot got developed and okay, okay. All right, that makes more sense. Okay. Thank you, that was my, that was my question. Okay, are there other questions from the council? Are there any questions from the public or comments? Okay, then I bring it back to the council. Do we, uh, do we need a motion for this? Um, yes, you should make a motion just authorizing staff to submit the report to HCD. Okay, does anybody want to make any comments or does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make the motion. Okay, I'll, I'll second. Jeff, thank you. Roll call. Council member Alves. Yes. Council Member Warnikoff? Yes. Council Member Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes? Aye. Mayor Derwin? Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Laura. Okay, item number nine is a recommendation by the town manager. Amendments to qualifications for planning and architectural and site control commissioners. Jeremy? Thank you, Mayor Derwin, members of the council. As you recall, in December, the council uh, made an appointment to the um, ASCC. Um, that appointment um, uh, included a number of applicants, one of whom was actually lived in the sphere of influence but outside the city um, limits. The current uh, handbook for committees and commissions allows the council to appoint members to both commissions and all the committees who live in the sphere of influence. But during, um, during those discussions around the time that uh, the ACC member was appointed, there were some uh, concerns about whether or not it was appropriate to appoint members to the two commissions that oversee land use recommendations um, and policies in town who lived outside of uh, town limits. So based on the concerns that I heard, I drafted some very basic revisions to the committee handbook that would limit appointments to those two commissions to um, only residents, not to people who live outside of uh, town limits or in the sphere of influence. Uh, nothing else to uh, add to that and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Questions from the council? Wow, what a really serene crowd it is tonight. Are there any questions from the public? Okay, coming back to the council, does anyone? Okay, what, what are our thoughts about this? I have a, I'm sorry. John. Okay. Um, I have a, a sort of a question combined with a comment. On red page 83, um, where the commission's an advisory committee handbook, it uh, goes into, uh, it's referring to the old status of this situation. And I, I don't know if this still applies on the first paragraph, it says the town council may on a case by case basis waive the town residency requirement. Um, it's not clear that that is applying just for committees or, well, anyway, I think it maybe is something that ought to be cleaned up, um, but just wanted to make sure that wasn't another reason that was left in there. Uh, through the chair, I left that in there on uh, purpose. I did not uh, amend it to give the council in some extreme circumstances the opportunity to do so. But if the council mm -hmm. wishes, I can obviously make some minor tweaks to change that to only refer to uh, committees. Okay. 
Are there other questions? I had a question and now I can't even find it, but where's the language volunteers for the, okay. So red page 72, at the bottom in red, it says volunteers for the planning commission and the architectural site control commission. So live in Petrola Valley and no applications from residents of lands in the sphere of influence shall be considered. So Portola Valley includes Ladera, Los Trancos. Um, now in the next piece of the sentence, it sort of clarifies it, but do we need to say Portola Valley proper or should there be any clarification there? Or do you feel that the rest of the sentence makes it clear? I think probably I think think town of would clarify that. No, town, okay. Yeah. Okay, so she'll live in the town of Portola Valley. Thanks. Does anybody else have any thoughts or comments on this? I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, I was I was just going to say that that yeah, I think this is sensible. Um, we we had sort of talked about it and realized this was the case, so I was happy to uh, see it happen, and I would I would be happy to make a motion to approve. Uh, if I may, would the council like there to be changes made to the area that John mentioned? Um, oh, to, does does the council want to keep some limited authority in special circumstances? Um, or would it be would it be just easier just to delete that make it clear in that reference it's for committees only? I, oh, Greg, <laughs> I, I think it would be good to to keep it in there as it is. Um, you know, I I can foresee a potential circumstance where there just are no applicants from within the town. I mean, we haven't seen that over the last couple cycles, but going back a decade or two, it's probably been the case that there just aren't applicants sometimes. And so I think for the council to have that ability in case of a need to fill the seat um, would be a good thing to do. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense too. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't gonna cause confusion, but I think it's, I think it's reasonable, straightforward enough. I think yeah, I, I agree with Craig. Yeah. Sarah? Do you agree? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I agree with Craig. Okay. All right. So again, this is only for ASCC and Planning Commission. Committees still can draw from sphere of influence. So would someone like to make a motion? Uh, I'll, I'll withdraw my first motion. I'll, I'll, I'll move that with, uh, with the corrections we've noted here, um, so clarifying town of Portola Valley, uh, I will move to approve. Thanks. Second. Craig has seconded. Roll call. Councilmember Alves. Aye. Councilmember Wernickoff. Yes. Councilmember Richards. Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes. Aye. Mayor Derwin. Aye. Okay. Item number 10 is the first of two colleagues memos. This one's from Vice Mayor Hughes. And it is, you read the correct language, potential use of open space funds for open space easements. Craig? Yes, hello colleagues. Um, this is um, a fairly straightforward thing. It's an idea that occurred to me, um, came from a few sources, uh, donations of open source easements to the town, um, discussions at the finance committee and open space about how the value of land is going up seemingly faster than we're accumulating money in our open space fund to acquire it. Um, and it occurred to me that there might be a possibility in some cases on some pieces of land of acquiring not the land itself, but of paying owners to dedicate uh, open space easements on their land. Um, and in some cases they might be thinking of doing that, but costs are prohibitive um, they don't want to hire the attorneys and pay the recording fees and so on. Um, and so there might be an opportunity for the town to essentially purchase those easements 
by paying just enough money to cover the costs, um, essentially. Um, so there's there's a number of things that need to be worked through in terms of the details of how that would work and identifying which properties we might want to do that for and so on, um, for which I would recommend we, we refer it to the Open Space Acquisition Committee to discuss, but to essentially point them in the direction of saying, we think this might be a good idea and they um, could hopefully with staff figure out a mechanism for doing that. And um, I think uh, Cara had identified a couple issues that we need to work through in terms of how you actually go about some of the mechanical logistical issues of it. Um, but it seems like something that's doable and, and could potentially get us a lot more bang for our buck uh, for our open space acquisition fund than buying land outright. Okay. For which there are just not a lot of opportunities also. Okay. Council, do you have any questions of Craig about his memo, his idea? Well, I had a question. Are you, are you, are you proposing that this idea is referred to the Open Space Acquisition Committee? Yes, I think there's some detail that needs to be worked through in terms of, um, you know, how, how we, I think a big part of it is going to be publicizing it, frankly, trying to find people who might be interested in, in making those donations. Um, but also, you know, potentially targeting that to say, oh, well, we're looking for pieces of land that connect to other pieces of land or connect to existing easements and that sort of thing, um, or along trails or um, wherever it might be. Um, I think there, um, Cara had, had, had asked a question about whether people expected to have access to the open space land. And so exactly what rights and easement should have in it, I think might also be part of what the open space committee could, could think about and bring back to us. Um, whether we want to spend all of the money or just put a limit on it of saying, well, up to a certain amount, um, that those sorts of things, I think the open space acquisition committee could kind of chew on and, and come back to us with a more specific proposal. This, this um, memo was really just to um, see whether the rest of you thought it would be worth having the open space committee kind of think in this direction and, and come up with a more concrete proposal, not to actually do anything imminent, imminently. Right, and, and have you discussed it with them? Uh, I've discussed it with the chairperson, Terry, uh, briefly just to sort of say, hey, I've thought about this and I'm gonna be bringing it to the rest of the council. Um, and he seemed um, interested in the concept and um, I think he's sort of penciled in putting it on their next agenda if, if, um, if we do refer to them to talk about it. Thanks. Right. Um, question? No um, question. You have a question. No, I, I, yeah. Um, is this something, I mean, are you thinking that, that we'd sort of just pay kind of the, the frictional cost, so to speak, of an easement? And are you thinking of this for so maybe somebody who's, you know, maybe on a fixed income and has limited funds? Or are you thinking of this for anyone? Because um, some of these, I mean, some easements will carry tax advantages to them. And we could probably do a better job of just advertising just somebody, somebody could, some people could probably, you know, save themselves some tax burden, but I just, I, is it, I mean, I just don't want, I just don't want it to go to paying, you know, the bills of legal bills of somebody who can afford them. Yeah, I, I think it's really, and, and I think exactly who and what we offer is something that I think it would be good for the open space acquisition committee to digest. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, I, I think a sort of rough guideline or, or what I will suggest to them anyway, as they're discussing it is that we probably don't want to pay more than what the frictional costs are. Um, and, um, and, you know, even if it were somebody who might pay their own legal bills, but they don't want to go through the hassle of it, it may be that that's enough of an inducement to yeah. get an open space easement, then maybe it's worth it, even if, you know, even if they would be able to afford it, um, it you know, it, it's, it's, um, I think having that option out there may shake loose some people who've been thinking about, oh, I don't really ever need to build on that back piece of land I have. And um, if it's easy for them to put an open space easement on it, they, they might be inclined suddenly to do so where they otherwise wouldn't. Okay, Sarah? Is there a specific situation or, um, you know, are, are there specific 
um, opportunities that are available right now that has brought this to a head or like what I, the background none that I know of specifically. It, it was really brought on by um, the uh, the Lipmans recently uh, created an open space easement on their property um, and they donated that. We didn't pay anything for it. Um, but that, you know, that combined with a few other things to sort of put this idea in my head that there may be opportunities out there for people who um, might be interested in something like that. Um, if, if the financial burden and or headache were you know, the, the hassle of going through it were, were taken away. So I don't know of any specific opportunities, but that, that would be for the open space acquisition committee to um, do their target hunting um, as they've done in the past uh, for, for purchasing properties. They could, um, they tend to have their ear pretty close to the ground for people who might be interested in this sort of thing. And just to add a little background to that, I mean, uh, easements like this are, are, are a kind of prime target that the Open Space Committee and, and Post for that matter, sort of, I mean, they, they, they buy things, but they both, you know, all the open space organizations are often looking for easements sort of above and beyond just the outright purchases of land. So it's, I mean, it's a, it's a situation we could definitely see happen in the future. And then maybe this, maybe this, yeah, just, just sort of get somebody to do something they weren't going to do before. So. Don? Yeah, I, I believe there have been a few situations in the past where the opportunities have come up that would have been nice to have it, be able to get a conservation easement over a piece of property for trail extensions or for uh, better better trail positioning and that kind of thing. Um, but the the lack of a financial incentive that was uh, didn't didn't let, make people want to do it. I, I think this is, is a really good idea, and I do think it ought to be discussed by the Open Space Acquisition Committee to try to set some boundaries because I also could imagine people thinking, oh, gee, I can help pay for part of my projects here by just you know, slapping a conservation easement across the front of my lot, which wouldn't necessarily do us any good at all. So um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a great thing to pursue. Good yeah, idea. I think it's it's definitely gonna be important for them to sort of lay out you know what what kind of criteria we're looking for in a piece of land because we don't we probably don't want to accept a you know, paying for a, a, a conservation easement on a piece of land that's unbuildable anyway because it's on a cliff face or something and doesn't connect to anything. There's there's no particular reason we should do that and why waste our money on it. Um, but there may, as you say, be some some interesting prospects that allow trail extensions mm -hmm. or wildlife corridors or whatever other compelling reasons there might be to to go you know try and find some of these pieces of land and, and stitch them together. Okay. Uh, members of the public, I see one hand up. Mary Hefty. There. Um, I would like to congratulate you on thinking outside of the box on, on, uh, on conservation. I think it's a, it's a wonderful idea if it's done right. And I totally applaud your getting it through the open space people first. Uh, I have personally have an interest in finding out what the conservation easements are currently in town. I know on my property, on many uh, properties in Westridge, we have, uh, I have a third, at least a third of my property in conservation easement uh, on the deed. And uh, I have asked uh, the town and, and others if there's anywhere there's a record of what the conservation easements are and the pattern of conservation easements throughout the town. Because I, I believe, uh, and I have reason to believe that they were put in for animal corridors and for habitat conservation. Um, and uh, I think it would be wonderful for the town to give us access to what that those corridors look like as they are uh, have been planned out and how they are working through our town um, and just put it out to you guys that it it I, I've thought of taking it on myself to tell you the truth of uh, finding <laughs> out all these deeds and finding out uh, where the easements are but I sure would love some help uh, in doing that because I think it's a very exciting point of how our landscape can be utilized for conservation. Okay, thanks. Uh, that is an interesting question. Jeremy, do you know if we keep a record of that? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know that we have a specific record. Um, 
I, I can check with staff uh, to see. That would certainly be something that uh, we could put together over time. Or, or Cara, do you know if it's possible, can you go to the county and ask them for a list of all of the easements in favor of a particular party? I don't know if that's something you can even find. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think the um, the county assessor or, or county reporter yet has a database that um, is searchable. Um, given those parameters, I would say that where I would probably first go is the the larger subdivisions um, as a condition of approval. Certainly, um, in in when um, the town was incorporated and the town was granting the subdivisions. Um, conservation easements were um, pretty routine. So, um, you know, we could look at, at all of the large subdivisions um, in town and, and find some that way. Ready. Okay, back to the council. What are your thoughts about this one? Do is anyone, I mean, I've already heard from several people that they think this is a good idea. John, correct? Yes, I agree, absolutely. I, Jeff? Yes. You think it's a good idea? I agree, we should we should forward it to the Open Space Committee and, uh, and get, their, get their input on it, yeah. Sarah? I agree. Okay. Then <clears throat> I think I need a motion. Do I need a motion? Might as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be helpful to have a motion. Yep. Um, so move. So the space committee knows what the direction is. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, Jeff made the motion. Second, please. Second. Second. John seconded. Roll call, please, Sharon. Council Member Alves. Aye. Council Member Warnikoff. Yes. Council Member Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes? Aye. Mayor Derwin? Aye. Thank you for that, Craig. Yep, and thank you all. I will take this to open space. Item number 11 is another colleague's mem memo. I've never heard this term before, so it's hard for me to say it. This one is from Council Members Jeff Alps and John Richards, and it is regarding an update on COVID restrictions on town center indoor access and activities. Who is going to handle this, Jeff or John? Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, so, you know, last year, last March, obviously, we, we ended up closing, uh, <laughs> closing town hall to uh, any in-person business and eventually we're able to, well, it's over time, have been able to actually uh, transition almost all of our work to remote work. Um, staff is now back in the building and um, they are actually, they're staff on a kind of a part-time as needed basis. So there's two, the staff's divided into two teams and they're uh, alternate weeks, but a lot of people I think still work remotely. Um, Jeremy can fill in details here. And we just uh, we just talked about what, when, and and how we could go back to sort of having appointments um, in person at town center. And you know, I think we've our our emphasis last year was just always on kind of the the safety and comfort of our staff. We think that really needs to continue to be the priority. And so our initial thought is that we would not want to, you know, we would probably limit, well, we, we would still not allow access, you know, we would still basically be doing all in-person appointments um, until staff is fully vaccinated um, and until um, we go back into yellow. I mean, uh, the county under orange still discourages uh, indoor meetings of any kind. So we're, I mean, the official, you know, the guidance from the county and state still say that we probably shouldn't be having sort of in-person appointments and that we should, um, that we should, I think, I think what we'd like to do is continue sort of what we're doing right now with, is just continue to offer it to remote services as we've been doing and then consider in person um, going forward uh, again with the vaccinations and the hopefully, hopefully imminent return to yellow. So uh, John or Jeremy, if you wanna amplify on that or, or correct me, please. No, I, I agree. That uh, sounds about what we discussed. And uh, I think beyond that, the, um, the idea of getting the staff back in the in the office together, I think, goes beyond the um, the 
it added convenience to uh, townsfolk to come in and, and do their business. It also is a, the staff is is particularly known for working together and and helping out helping each other out and cooperating intently. So if they can't really do that, it doesn't make a whole lot of more sense to, to bring them into the same building and same office um, until they can. Um, and that really is gonna happen when they're vaccinated. So mm -hmm. fortunately it looks like that's maybe moving along quicker and quicker. So hopefully we'll be there before we know it. Okay, do you have any more to add? I would add uh, through the chair, you know, we're, we're waiting our turn for vaccinations. Um, all staff is being encouraged, highly encouraged to get vaccinations. There's no mandate to do so. Um, you know, should a member of staff who's forward facing, not wish to get vaccinated, uh, there's a, a process by which we'll, we'll talk to them about their duties and how that looks, at least in the period of time where there's still risk um, associated with um, interactions. Um, and I think just to add a little, uh, a little more, um, the, as I understood the subcommittee's um, uh, direction or thoughts here is that this would, you know, also include any other town sponsored gatherings such as, you know, our, our meetings, uh, committee meetings, commission meetings, um, the use of the facilities uh, by for rentals and the like until we're in a, a, a different place. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay, questions from the council. Okay, I have a question. So we're not just talking about when the staff's coming back, we're also talking about when we'll have in-person council meetings, planning commission meetings, conservation committee meetings, all that stuff, correct? Yes. And the same principles apply? Um, well, for, for staff participation, I'd say, yeah, at least, I mean, definitely, you know, everyone vaccinated, uh, ballots back in the yellow. You know, we, we talked a little bit about meetings, public meetings in particular. And, you know, we were thinking, I mean, I, I, I will suggest, and I think, you know, committee members should, should have some say on this, but I just, I would suggest that the committee members work quite well over Zoom um, so that we might, there might be a point where we consider bringing council meetings back um, and maybe commission meetings just because I think they make, I think there's a little, there's an argument to bring those back in some form in person as we figure out how to do kind of this, the hybrid meeting. I don't think we're ever gonna get away from people participating remotely. So we have to figure out how we're gonna do that. Um, I just think, I think we're, I think that that ship has sailed and we're just, that's the, the future is, is always going to include some aspect of this. But, um, you know, we thought that the, probably the council and commission meetings were the priority and the committee meetings could very well just continue for the, for the future on, on Zoom. We, we thought that I, seems to work pretty well. So that was my, that was our thought on it. I'd uh, love to hear other people's thoughts on that. Okay. Are there other thoughts? Uh, if I may, Mayor Derwin, the, the other thing that I think came up during the conversations the subcommittee had was just related to, um, you know, there's no way to, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be requiring members of the committees to get vaccinated uh, or members of the public, yeah. but there's going to be a threshold point where um, we can reasonably say that a certain percentage of the population has been vaccinated. And at that point, it makes sense to open up our, our facilities in a way that would be safer, if you will. Um, you know, until that time, our facilities, if people go and they haven't been vaccinated or have other issues, our facilities could be contributing to people getting COVID even as things improve. So I, I wanted to add that element. Well, these conversations are going on in other cities mm -hmm. right now. I think, um, you know, I, I guess as, as I was reviewing it, I was thinking more about the staff and the operations of town center. And I think that what's being proposed there makes total sense. Um, I think it gets murkier and more complicated once you go out to volunteer committees and all of that. So I'm, I'm not quite sure to be honest what I think about that aspect yet, but um, as far as like the very spe specific um, you know, town situation with staff members, I think what you guys have proposed makes sense. Okay. Marianne, I'm actually just curious, have you heard, you know, is there a consensus out there among other jurisdictions? Are there people talking about doing what we're doing or doing something different? 
no consensus. And I no one, think- No one knows, okay. No one knows. You know, yeah. Hybrid models, that's all I've heard. I will yeah. do hybrid models. Not, I mean, for council meetings. As far as staff, I'm not sure. I don't know what's yeah. happening with staff. Um, are there members of the public who have comments or questions? Christy. Thank you. I was just from our perspective of being a, a resident, is there ever any way we could sit outside the front door and look at documents and then hand them back to you? Because we're, we're outside and we're touching something, but we know it's more transmitted by air. So I'm I'm finding myself having to pay a lot of money per page or per project, however you wanna think about it to look at things, but I don't really need them. I just wanna glance through things and hand them back. Can you discuss what you think about that? I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any comments about that. I mean, do my, any of my colleagues have a comment? Can I ask what? Projects here. I mean, what kind of projects are we talking about? Um, actually, I've never seen a draft EIR, so I wanted to look at the town's past EIR of something, so I get an idea. What is an EIR? What does it look like? Do I have to go to another town and get it, or where do I look at these things of past oh. projects from the town? A lot of those should be in submission packets for previous planning commission or ASCC meetings. So you can probably get them from the agenda packets for those meetings, Christy. And, and well, PDF I'm actually one. just, yeah, I'm asking for it, but I got, you know, 53 pages for $53. That's a dollar a page. And then in, in the, um, what you charge is normally 30 cents. So, but during COVID it's gonna cost me more. I, I'm running into issues just to look at things. Well, I think until we're fully operational with everybody in the office, it's, it's gonna be tough. I think it is. Well, I think it's just, we all have to be able to access information without going broke too. Yeah. Judy? If, if I could, through the chair, um, a, a lot of the information is available online. Um, so that is, is one option if you don't want to actually um, have a hard copy of a document, you could, you could certainly um, search online and you can also ask for a, a Public Records Act request and, and staff will be happy to help you um, uh, and, and provide you with electronic documents. That's typically the way um, Public Records Act requests these days are administered. So, um, you know, we can just supply electronic copies of, of particular documents. So um, I don't believe we are seeing any um, requesters actually come to town hall um, as, as just a matter of, of practice at this point. Through the chair, uh, uh, Christie's requested a number of documents, and some of which were much older. They weren't available electronically. We needed to send them out for copy. Um, so there's a cost associated with that that we could recover. Um, so um, where we've been able to provide them electronically, we have. When, when we haven't been able to, we've, we've sent them out. Okay. Judy. Um, I have two things. One is um, conservation committee. We have assumed now that uh, the restrictions are lightening up that if we have a subcommittee of two or three or four members, we might begin meeting outside masked and at a distance. Is there any reason we can't be doing that given this? Okay. I will defer to 
Parks Council, yeah. but I assume that if you're volunteers and, and you, you guys want to meet in person that you can you can do that. I'd say I'm guessing that for a Brown Act meeting, we probably still need to make it available to the public via Zoom. But if you guys are meeting as a subcommittee, then I, no, I it's don't a subcommittee, but it's, right, right. It, if it's, but not it's Brown Act, then town, it's nonetheless town business. So I just want to make sure that this proposal that you're talking about now doesn't limit that. <clears throat> I, OK, I don't Great. think so. And yeah. Just, Okay, thank you. And part two of that is, uh, as for reopening the town center, from what you said, if you have one or two staff members that um, refuse vaccination, does that mean that the town center reopening will be postponed indefinitely? Through the chair, no. No. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I should I should amend that to say we should amend that to say people either staff is vaccinated or has de declined a vaccination. Okay. Whatever, Thank you very whatever, much. Who, yeah, that's that's Appreciate a fair point. Yes. To give just to give that a little a little color. So, um, <laughs> what I've discussed with staff at Cara, very helpful in preparing the the policy was that um, you know should we have members of staff who do not wish to vaccinate that we would look at what tasks they perform and modify their duties as needed during a period of time where um, you know, there may be issues, particularly if there's forward facing staff or, or otherwise. Um, so far, no, no issues. Um, if anything comes up, I'll speak to the mayor and vice mayor about it. Great, thank you. Okay. Back to the council. Mayor Derwin? Yes. Uh, Betsy Morgan-Thaler? Oh. Got her hand up. Oh wait, maybe it's down now. Betsy, did you want to speak? Okay, I guess not. Okay, back to the council. Um, let me start with so Jeff and John wrote the report. So I think I know how they feel. How about you, Craig? I think it sounds like the right plan. Okay. And Sarah, you've already uh, commented that you feel it's a good idea. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And I agree with my colleagues. So is there a motion? Do we need a motion for this or was it, it, it didn't? Did for the other one. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I will, um, I'll move the council approve uh, our colleagues memo. Second. I'll second it. Okay, roll call. Councilmember Alves? Aye. Councilmember Warnikoff? Yes. Councilmember Richards? Aye. Vice Mayor Hughes? Aye. Mayor Derwin? Aye. Great. And now we are to item 12 Council Liaison Committee and Regional Agency Reports. Let's start with John. Okay, I uh, had the Planning Commission meeting the last uh, week and uh, heard a part of what went on already. Um, let's see, discussion about Fort Hollowood Road Fire Station 8, discussion of options for uh, zoning, whether or not there was a, an opportunity, uh, a need to change the uh, Make a change to the zoning code to uh, include a um, reference and a definition of uh, public building in the R1 zone. Uh, apparently, it already exists in the RE zone, which is most of the town. Um, but that's an ongoing discussion. Um, it was very widely supported by pretty much everyone who spoke, and there's uh, they presented a redlined plan uh, showing revision of the driveways and parking to satisfy some of the neighborhood complaints, uh, which was uh, fairly well received. Uh, this will be coming to us if there is a zoning change and um, we'll be um, going back to the ASCC as well for their final review once they finish the plans. Um, let's see. That was the main item on the agenda. Um, and then they, Laura gave them a, the same element, housing element update that we just heard. So that was uh, that. 
Um, then uh, last night we had conservation committee meeting uh, where Jeremy did a presentation on the PV donates uh, program and uh, uh, let's see, a long, long oral communication discussion of the situation of the tree clearing over at, uh, at Sequoia's. Not a discussion, it was oral communications. Uh, and then uh, there was discussion of several projects, uh, one at 35 Possum Lane that uh, has considerable amount of tree removal proposed that went into a long, long discussion. Um, mostly supported by the neighbors, uh, sort of a, a philosophical discussion on the, on the committee based on how do you, what do you recommend in terms of what determines whether or not they should be removed? Is it a conservation issue or not? Or, you know, so anyway, it's a, it was a long discussion. I don't know that it was fully resolved, but uh, I expect it will be at some point. And uh, I think that was it. <clears throat> Okay. Thanks. How about Sarah? Um, let's see. I had um, creative arts um, or cultural arts met. They decided tentatively for um, their event that's going to be um, some sort of renewal uh, concept. Uh, they're looking at mid to later September at this point for that. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and then they are um, in process of planning a youth photo exhibit. Um, <clears throat> and then they have a date, uh, May 21st, um, and flyers are circulating to the schools and it will be at town center and um, viewing will be TBD pending what's going on with COVID rules at that time, but at a minimum through windows and outdoors. And they also have an author's event that they're brainstorming right now. Um, Sequoia's, I, I now have a monthly with Rob and this may be old news to those of you that aren't as new as I am, um, just about their master planning um, that's going on there. And he shared that as part of it, there's new amenities, um, obviously the workforce housing that we've heard about for some time and possibly some new senior housing as part of it. So all on that property. Um, so that was the news, the piece of news out of that. Um, there wasn't a meeting of the website subcommittee. Finance subcommittee continues to meet weekly. Um, you know, last time we talked, I think it, the, we had to hope that by this point, it was this would be two weeks after um, you know the meeting on the eighth, and uh, I think there was an expectation that there would be progress on the core financial system. And based on what I heard this week from Jeremy, I doesn't sound like we're there yet. Um, and so, to me, you know, that continues to be a concern. Um, I also learned, you know, that we we paid the full implementation fee as well as the. Um, you know, subscription for the past year um, and we still don't have a working system. So I just wanted to mention that as a, 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 an additional concern. So I, Jeremy, I suspect we'll touch on this in his manager's report, but uh, those are my updates on that. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Let's see, Jeff. Okay, um, we had a, last Thursday, we had a fire committee, the ad hoc fire committee met. Um, um, I guess, uh, so we, uh, uh, Megan Koch replaced uh, Dana Breen as the ASCC member on the committee. Um, we got some updates uh, from the committees. Uh, I guess the main ones just being, uh, just outreach to some of our larger, one of our, one of the initiatives the committee has come up with is just sort of this work with larger properties to get sort of come up with sort of holistic property management plans. And they've actually, outreach, I think they've reached out to and had controversies about five of the 10 large property owners, something in that range. So they're making progress on that. Uh, the fire marshal gave an update on some proposals he's been working with the committees on. And we had a couple of really good presentations, one from Midpen on their work with uh, getting, trying to sort of, they're working in Windy Hill in particular, um, and a little bit on their Hawthorns and just, just um, it was there, one of their, um, 
botanists talking about just sort of to how they have their approach to all of their properties. And they, they have, I think, 11 properties in the, in the, in the area. So they talked about, but it was just, just their sort of immediate and long-term plans on both Windy Hill and the Hawthorns to, to create things like shaded fuel breaks and manage the, hopefully the coyote brush. Uh, and then pg e gave a presentation as well on their, um, their work on wildfire preparedness. Um, those are both informative. And then uh, Jeremy gave several updates or sort of ongoing things that we've, you know, the committee's been working on for a while. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to highlight from that, Jeremy. Um, I'll pull up, uh, please continue, Jeff. I'll pull up the agenda and just remind myself. Yeah, and um, I actually, unfortunately that night I missed the Nature and Science Committee meeting. I need to get an update from them on the, they're still working on their speaker series. Um, I need to get an update on when they're actually gonna roll out their first uh, event, but hopefully later, I guess at this point it might be early April, but uh, I'll, I'll have to get an update from them on that. Uh, that's that's all I have right now. Mayor Derwin, would you like me to provide some additional updates to the Wildfire Preparedness Committee meeting? Yes, please provide some additional updates to the Wildfire Preparedness Committee. Thank you. So the updates that came from staff included the, uh, the following. Um, the um, town staff, uh, um, we've had conversations with um, the insurance commissioner's office over the last several months regarding a variety of issues. Um, and, um, we are anticipating a meeting uh, between the mayor and the vice mayor and the insurance commissioner a little later this year, um, just to discuss our experiences, what we're learning and, and how that office can, can be of help to our residents. I, I am expecting the insurance commissioner to be reaching out to other cities in the area too um, on this. I think we've, we've helped push that along for them, which has been great. Um, I gave a quick update on the virtual emergency operations center. Um, we hope uh, actually, been agendized for next week, going to the Emergency Preparedness Committee with um, some thoughts on um, um, uh, a tool that we're proposing. Home hardening ordinance that's been, um, work, been worked on for a number of months uh, should be coming to um, the um, uh, bot, uh, commissions next month. Um, there's actually um, I'm holding a meeting tomorrow with uh, members of the Wildfire Committee a conservation committee and my staff and pg e to talk about some trees that um, are in their um, easement, uh, utility easement in town that could be um, candidates for removal. Uh, the fire marshal will be there as well. So we wanna coordinate that effort. Um, talk about PB donates. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. okay, back to the council who hasn't I, I'm sorry, Jeremy reminded me of one thing. Um, we talked about PV donates and one point that the, so the, the, the fire committee has actually been exploring the possibility of fundraising for some sort of larger fundraising for some communal work on, on fire removal in certain <laughs> parts of town. And their concern about the PV donates program was just they didn't want it to interfere with their fundraising purchases. And I feel like the PV donates is a much smaller targeted thing and probably doesn't, I, I don't feel like there's a lot of overlap between those two, but it was it was a fair point to consider that they're they're just trying to figure out what's going to work with this larger, you know, sort of funding for trying to trying to clear brush from certain places, which maybe people can't do it themselves. So, uh, Craig. Yes. Let's see. I had uh, no particular order. There was um, ASCC on Monday. A uh, new house project on Westridge, six twenty seven Westridge. Um, nice project, um, beautiful piece of land, lots of oak trees, um, and the um, applicant was doing initial conceptual design review. So this is something we used to do back when I was on ASCC from time to time when there were sort of bigger, more complex projects. They'd come before they really had fully developed set of plans to bounce things off the ASCC and say, this is what we're thinking um get early reactions so those can then be incorporated into the design rather than drawing up a full set of plans spending a lot of money and then running into issues um so i think it was pretty successful um bringing that back um i think laura and staff did a good job of of getting just about the right amount of detail there was some commentary that it might be useful to have a little bit more on the landscaping at least at, at a sketch level um to say you know we're thinking of 
roughly planting these kinds of things here and taking these trees out and that kind of stuff. Um, but overall, I think was was much appreciated by the ACC and, and the applicant and gave them a good um, good amount of feedback from the committee on or the commission on what they were thinking on the, about the project, um, which was generally positive and supportive. Um, then a trails committee meeting. Um, they talked about a bunch of their usual stuff. They, um, the chair updated them on the spring down donation um, and they were all very um, positively looking forward to the town uh, eventually acquiring that property and the opportunities that that provides uh, for trails and other equestrian uses and so on. Um, discussion of PB donates and how that might be useful. Um, and then also uh, under oh, was oral communication slash other business, they have oral communications at the beginning and other business at the end, both opportunities for comment by uh, the public and, and members of the committee. Um, they discussed also the, the Sequoia's trail um, destruction. <laughs> Not sure what the best word for it is um, and uh, what we might do and, and what path forward there might be there. Um, one thing that um, I thought might be helpful on that was potentially for some of the committee members to kind of get together with the, maybe, you know, trails, conservation, wildfire, um, get together and, and think about coming up with a set of design guidelines for defensible space clearing. Um, so, you know, similar to our other design line guidelines, we could have a don't do this, do do this kind of pictures, because I think we're going to see a lot of people in town uh, worrying about fire safety, pretend for maybe bringing in uh, Kellex from uh, RCD for some for some help and advice there to come up with some guidelines for people. So as they um, make their properties fire safe, they can do it in a way that um, is helpful rather than destructive. Uh, so uh, that was it. Oh, and there was a uh, Woodside Highlands Road Maintenance District residence advisory committee meeting yesterday that I was not able to attend yesterday evening. Um, and they were, I think, probably primarily focused on their uh, road resurfacing project where they're moving forward on contracting based on our budget approval we did last meeting. Um, oh, and one other thing on the, um, the subcommittee on reporting, financial reporting, um, there was an email from staff and Jeremy's probably going to talk about this in his manager report um, just today. So as a Monday, um, things ha had not, we didn't see a whole lot of positive progress signs from them. Um, Jeremy Ford an email today to the subcommittee um, that says that they have promising things to show him tomorrow in a meeting they have scheduled tomorrow. So um, hopefully finally we'll be making some progress on that and they they think they may even be able to show a set of reports to him um, which means hopefully they've got the integration done and things will start unblocking there um, we'll see tomorrow <laughs> um, and that's all I had thanks Craig I see there is a public hand up uh, Mary Hefty do you have something to comment on that you've heard already well, I was uh, 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 about, I was uh, interested in what Craig said about uh, the clearing and and thinking it also applied to my request for the conservation easements to be made more public, because it's been my experience in in, in my immediate neighborhood uh, that uh, uh, the enthusiasm for clearing, particularly in riparian zones, which are not particularly vulnerable to fire risk has been great uh, and, uh, and some of these areas are officially conserved um, and should be overseen if they, uh, if they are over, or at least might be vulnerable to being overseen if nothing else. Uh, uh, so I again would make a plea that we know where our conservation easements are in town, particularly in this situation where all the underbrush is being taken out of a lot of places. Okay, thanks. Okay, my reports. Sustainability Committee met with a new chair, Walt Hayes. Did a very good job. 
Brandy reported that uh, she has an intern, um, a student who is going to go to law school in the fall in Berkeley, and he's going to work on the cap and a piece of the website and some other sustainability work. And in June, she will get another intern who is a student at Cal Poly. There were some subcommittee report outs, the blackout protection subcommittee. They're the ones who are working on um, what you can do when you lose your power as we do, especially during fire season, um, using EV, solar, battery backup, et cetera. And I guess Walt and Stefan, who are that subcommittee, made a presentation to the Emergency Preparedness Committee. And Rebecca uh, suggested that they make some sort of a easy to understand document for the community that explains all the um, options that they've come up with. So I think they're going to do that. Lovereen talked about her book club that she wants to kick off. Uh, there was discussion of recruiting new members because there were only four members on that committee right now. There was an item calling correcting misinformation and this was brought forward by Rebecca Flynn. And she was talking about how when misinformation is published say someone says something on the PV forum, she thought it might be helpful for the sustainability committee to say, well, actually the sustainability committee says and corrects the record and gives factual information. Randy is going to set up an email address for the sustainability committee so that they can do that. Jeremy gave his PV donates speech. Then they talked about the budget. Um, there was also discussion about how we aren't doing Earth Fair this week, this week, this year, because Woodside dropped out and they have four people. I mean, they just can't do it. Uh, perhaps in the future, but not now. Um, and they went through other things that, you know, they don't need to have Earth. Earth, I don't know if they're even gonna do it for next year. I can't even recall. I think they took, they were a little bit flexible on where they put their money because they're not sure what they're going to do. Talked about a film lecture series. Uh, what else? And then there was an item about how the town plans to save water and encourage residents to do the same. In other words, um, you know, we're expecting that there's going to be drought messaging and they're going to gear up for that. I think that's mostly everything. Then there was a resource management climate protection committee, which is a CCAG committee, county committee uh, that happened, I think, the next day. And on the agenda was a report from Bosca from Tom Francis. That's Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation Agency. So uh, the state, I can't even read my writing. Hetch Hetchy is in good shape. It's normally 65% full right now. It's 56% full. They don't want it totally full right now. Um, droughts happening in a lot of places in the, in the state, uh, in most reservoirs, however, we are lucky because our system really works well. We can go two years, two dry years, and we're good. Um, rainfall, as you know, January was a good month. February, not so good. March, a little better than February, but not great. Um, 1977 was the driest year ever on record. 1983 was the wettest year ever on record. 2020 was a dry year, but not as bad as the driest year. Looks like we're tracking close to 2020. Upcountry snowpack is better than last year. Not quite at average, but definitely better than last year. Weather outlook, not good. Looking dry. 
And in the, um, if you look at NOAA's drought monitor mapping, there are very dark red colors, which shows severe drought already. Um, our water use is good. We're still um, tracking close to the five-year average. We were, we were using a lot more water in 2013 than we are now. Uh, last year, water use spiked up in February and March, but then dropped down because it was warm. SFPUC will not make a drought determination until April 15, but BOSCA and other water agencies are um, coordinating on possible drought messaging. It's possible, we don't know what they're gonna say, could be a voluntary rationing. Um, the worst situations in Marin County, they are already They've already made the call for a drought. Let's see what else I've got. And then we had an item on, there's a lot of water storage stuff. There was an item on a um, Orange Memorial Park stormwater treatment and reuse project in South San Francisco. There was a, an item about um, CCAG's efforts to advance uh, countywide collaboration on regional scale stormwater management projects to help address climate resilience, water quality, and water supply. And this is CCAG's Matt Fabry. He's just amazing in this um, genre, talking about um, all the stormwater projects we have that are green infrastructure and how you can do, it's sort of like what Kellick said, you can do a lot of things at once, take care of a lot of issues. Uh, and then there was an update on Bay Ren single family residential electrification case study project. What else have I got here? <clears throat> Yet another search committee meeting. This is a CCAG subcommittee to um, replace the current executive director. And we figured out how many screeners we would have for the applications and who those screeners would be. And we talked about whether to have a single panel um, interview panel or two interview panels. One would be more subject matter experts. And I think that was most of it. Flood and sea level rise resiliency district. There was an update on Bayfront Canal and there's a little wrench in the works. This is this project that has gotten so close to being able to um, start. And the Regional Water Quality Control Board has held it up. Um, and it's a very complicated reason why. Um, we applied two and a half years ago, which is, should be enough time, but it isn't. They're also delaying our permit from the Army Corps. And um, it's, it sounds like it's a little bit of a rat's nest, but um, because we're on a deadline, a big deadline, and they say they're gonna get us the information by April 2, but just in case they aren't, they're already lining up their decks with legislators to try to put some um, pressure on them. And then we authorized a contract with the construction management firm to do that. Let's see what else. And then Dave Pine reported out about uh, one of his little committees. This is the committee that's looking in long-term funding for the agency. And right now they're, they're, uh, they have an idea to do a parcel tax. This would go on the ballot. They've engaged a pollster. It'll be, we'll talk about it further at the next meeting. Um, we got a report on a lot of legislation around um, the resiliency bills where perhaps there would be money for our agency. And the League of Women Voters has got this um, series on water and wildfire. And the next one will be on April 8, having to do with Santa Cl uh, San Carlos, San Mateo, Belmont, Redwood Shores. That's water, April 29th, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park, uh, South Redwood City, water. And then June 3, and I will let you guys know about this, it's going to be about uh, wildfire. The League of Women Voters 
presentations, I think, are, are usually really pretty good. Okay. That. And then I did something really nice uh, this week. What day was it? Maybe it was Tuesday. I can't remember. Uh, every year, Meals on Wheels, the Peninsula Volunteers, um, round up all the mayors in the southern San Mateo cities, and they go out and help deliver the meals to the people, to the recipients. This year, they, we can't do that. So they had a, a call that we would make to all the people who would be on our route. So I was paired up with this woman named Shauna Hawk, who's the program manager of adult services for Peninsula Volunteers. And um, I was on the conference call and then we called, I think seven people and we talked to everybody but one. And it was really amazing. Um, the first person we talked to in Portola Valley actually knew who she was, but I won't say her name. And she's 87 and she was doing pretty well, but she had just gotten some bad health news. And we asked them things like, did you get your meal today? What's your favorite meal? Are you vaccinated? How are you doing? Things like that. Um, and she was very chatty. Then we talked to a woman in Atherton who was 107. And all these people live alone. That is what is so astounding to me. Um, the 87-year-old, I think she had a grandchild living with her uh, part-time. The 107 year old had a caregiver there. Um, and we asked how she was doing and she said, not so great today, but I am 107. What else? Uh, and we also asked, you know, who's visiting you, especially during COVID? And um, are you still, do the neighbors check in? You know, stuff like that. Let's see, then we talked to a 98 year old named Bruce who lives in Redwood City. Oh wait, we didn't talk to Bruce. That was the one we couldn't get through to. Renee, 82 years old, a man um, still working. And he was uh, very animated. And then we talked to Margo who's 88 and she, uh, <laughs> I'm trying, oh, she was so funny because uh, the Shauna had said, well, Margo, today we have, we have the mayor of Redwood, of Redwood City, the mayor of Portola Valley on the call. And Margo goes, why? And I thought that was such a good response. It was a really, it was a, it was a, a reminder that there are so many people out there who are alone and lonely. And it just made me think that I think the way that we live and the way that we treat our older people isn't right. I think people should live in family compounds. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to say was, this was uh, uh, something that came through in an email to me from Chris Rasmussen, who's the commissioner for San Mateo County Mental Health and Substance Abuse Recovery. He said, May is Mental Health Month. And he was wondering if all the 20 cities will um, do proclamations to say May is Mental Health Month, he can give us a template. And he also is asking all the 20 cities to light key city buildings lime green, because green is the official color of mental health, and that would be shining the light on mental health. I'm not sure that we can do the lime green lighting, but if it's okay with you, I would like to do a proclamation. Okay, great. Jeremy, your report. Thank you, Mayor German and members of the council. So uh, I did wanna start with the uh, situation at the Sequoias. I've had a number of um, phone calls this week with uh, representatives of both the Sequoias and then the parent organization Sequoias Living. Um, I have uh, appreciated their responsiveness to my phone calls. Um, I, um, I expect there to be um, a considerable amount of work moving forward between the town and the Sequoias related to ensuring that the area that's been 
impacted is thoughtfully restored, replanted, and uh, mitigated and made monitored over, over the coming years. And the Sequoias have um, um, every request that I've made and every ask that I've made, they have positively responded to that. Um, we do plan to have some staff, uh, excuse me, some town representatives tomorrow, staff and town representatives tomorrow at a meeting at the Sequoias of their landscape committee. Um, and I do expect a, a message from the Sequoias to be coming out about what's happened um, in the coming days. Um, today, um, the county, uh, Woodside, uh, Patrol Valley was at this meeting and um, um, uh, the fire district uh, attended a, a grant meeting. We all joint applied for a grant. That's a very nice hat you have there, Jeff. I have to see, I have to say. Um, <laughs> um, uh, beg your pardon, I'm gonna feed him. So I'm listening, um, I'll be off screen for a second here. <laughs> we applied for a grant from the community partnership, uh, CPAW, I'm gonna forget the acronym, it'll, it'll come to me in a second. Um, with our partners in these jurisdictions, it's uh, community planning for wildfires. And uh, based on the conversation, it sounds like we actually will be receiving some resource from them. It's not monies, it's it's uh, expertise. Um, very exciting. We've applied for this grant resource opportunity in the past. Um, and uh, it, sound, it sounds a lot like this year we, we uh, cracked that nut. So um, I'm delighted there'll be more coming from us. We'll, we'll likely do a presentation to the council um, once this comes through. Um, I, I've been talking to Don Bullard about um, the letter that he sends out on behalf of the district on an annual basis to all residents around um, uh, vegetation management for wildfires. And we have some ideas on how to improve that letter in a way that brings some clarity to when people should be doing work, how they should go about getting permits, um, even, uh, I think it was actually a suggestion from Craig, some ideas, maybe have some photos um, showing what to do. Um, so Don is pretty excited about it. So I'll help, uh, you know, I'm gonna start talking with him and then obviously we'll get the committees involved um, and have them review what uh, the district puts out. Um, this is more of an, uh, a story, I think, than anything else. You may know that uh, we've enlisted the help of Congresswoman Anna Eshoo as it relates to a permit to upgrade our AM radio um, station to have a more broadcasting power. That permit application has been sitting at the FCC for about a year. Um, so Congressman Eshoo sent a letter to the FCC asking them to you know, move things along. I was contacted by the FCC on Friday. Um, and instead of a conversation about uh, getting the permit moving along, they um, wanted to talk about the fact that a year ago we used the AM radio twice to broadcast meetings and that that was a violation of our permit. Um, it was one of the more bureaucratic meetings I've taken in a while. Um, uh, the good thing was we did have a conversation about the permit and they said that they would uh, do their best to, to move that forward. Um, but I just thought it was an interesting, <laughs> interesting discussion. I too participated in the Meals on Wheels calls uh, a couple of weeks ago. They were, uh, they were wonderful uh, talking with residents um, and um, just hearing from them about how they like the program and how they're doing. Um, and uh, I, hope, I hope you all get an opportunity to do that in the future. Um, I have completed uh, conversations with all the committees per the council's request on PV Donate. So I'll be coming back with all of these thoughts that we heard. I would say overall, the people were fairly enthusiastic for the program, thought that the committees would uh, participate. They were interested, so that was good. Um, we have been trying to schedule a neighborhood watch captain's meeting. Um, we just have had some trouble coordinating uh, the sheriff's office, but right now we're aiming for May um, to get that going. And that's something we do on an annual basis as a check-in. Um, this The timing is actually pretty good for May because theoretically more people will be traveling this summer. So to remind them of what they should do in the summer months if they're not here. Um, the um, I wanna end with two Good pieces of news. I think everyone saw that the all sports courts open and our basketball hoops are up. And um, the vice chair of the um, of the uh, Parks and Rec Committee put out a, a note on uh, the forum. We hadn't seen a lot of use in the last couple of days, but I'm hoping that ticks up in a safe manner. And on Thursday, I signed the spring down pledge. 
Um, so that is done. Um, so we'll be getting copies of that. So it's all in writing. Um, with that, that concludes my report. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Council Digest on March 11. Anything? Okay, Council Digest on March 18. Okay. Then we will leave this meeting, we will adjourn this meeting, and we will go into a closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54957, Public Employee Performance Evaluation, Title Town Manager. Now, Sharon, you're going to leave and you're going to make me host, correct? And then when I and then when I when I'm done with the meeting, I hit the stop meeting button. In the right bottom right. So are we automatically, so we just stay where we are? Yes. Okay. So I locked the meeting and I will make you host and then I'll uh, exit. You'll want to stop recording too once uh, you go. Yes. Into yes. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye, Jeremy. Oh, bye, Jeremy.